Hello and welcome to another episode of the Column Flame podcast. Today I'm talking to David Harper. He's a broadcaster with the BBC and other networks whose dulcet tones can be heard across the UK and right around the world. Hello, I'm David Harper. This is World Business Report on the BBC World Service. He covers everything, and I mean everything. A classical music festival in Denmark has opened with some canine additions to the orchestra. Three dogs participated in the performance near Copenhagen of The Hunting Symphony, a little-known piece by Mozart's father, Leopold. Although mainly he focuses on covering news and business affairs, sometimes broadcasting live to audiences in the millions. The BBC World Service is 90 years old today. Well known to many as a polished, professional and talented broadcaster, he surprised his listeners and viewers recently when he uploaded a video to X, formerly Twitter. I have something I want to tell you and it's not going to be terribly easy because it's not something I feel massively comfortable talking about, but I've decided to do it anyway. About 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, manic depression, if you will. In the video, he explained he has bipolar disorder and how it affects his life. There have been moments where I've not been the easiest person to be around. And in this podcast, David opens up about what it's like to suffer from extreme lows and manic highs. The idea of even just kind of getting dressed is, it seems like the most, you know, unobtainable dream. There's been times when I've just sort of got an idea in my head and got in the car and driven to the other side of the country, all right? <laughs> and how most people have a certain perception of those who are bipolar because of Hollywood. Historically, the portrayals of, of mental health from Hollywood and other media outlets have always been great. You know, they're usually the crime dramas with the serial killer or something like that. We discuss if it even should be labelled a disorder. Shouldn't be seen as a disease that people need to be freed from. They should be seen as just a different way of being. And David explains what works for him in terms of living with it. Just getting out of bed and, and going for a long walk, could, you know, when I was at periods at my worst, um, that can back and help tremendously. From Global's newsroom, it is now eight o'clock. I'm David Harper. Good evening. Here's the this is the Colm Flynn podcast. I began by asking David how he first started his career in broadcasting. I'm not sure. I mean, it always interested me as a kid, but it was it was sort of, it happened by accident, really. Um, I, I just rocked up at a local radio station when I was about 16. I'd literally just left school. And they they sort of put me to work. I was, I was sort of fascinated by this newsroom and what was happening. And I started um, just doing bits and pieces for them. And then off the back of that, joined the BBC. And, and it just sort of went from there. So it was a chance to discovery, you might say. David, it's funny because everyone knows that the media industry is notoriously difficult to get into and stay into. But I love that you just said, I rocked up to a radio station, <laughs> got in, got a job, joined the BBC. Bada bing, bada boom. It, I, I, I'm oversimplifying a little bit. Um, I wish it was that easy, but um, it was, yeah, it was just a sort of chance moment where I, I, I saw this place and as a 16 year old to suddenly be in this environment where there's all these people running around and, and, and putting radio together and going out recording things and coming back and making programs. I'd never really been anywhere like that before. So the whole kind of immediacy uh, appealed to me. What is it that you still love today about it? David, because I know you're sitting there in the BBC at the moment, you're getting ready to start work, you'll be working on the BBC World Service, which is the jewel in the crown of the BBC's ra <laughs> radio output, really, you'll be doing the we news like bulletins. We like to think so. Yeah, and it, you know, it's the world's radio station, as they say, going all over the world. So what is it today you love about uh, the work that you do? Well, the World Service is a good case in point, because if you're if you're an inquisitive person who just likes to know about things that are going on, since I started working at the World Service, I, I'd like to think that I was the sort of person who was, who was across things going on in the world. But the amount of stuff you learn um, just by working for a global broadcaster like that, there are stories that you would never normally hear on, on more domestic outlets and other places. And it's just fascinating. Every day you turn up and you have no idea what's going to land on your desk. You don't know what's going to be what's going to be there, there next. Um, and it, and it's, it's just amazing. And, and it's also amazing the audience you have because you, you, you work your way up through the broadcast industry and you start off on a radio station where the, the listenership could be in double figures and then you, you work up and you, you get to bigger and bigger places. But the World Service is sort of like its own 
uh, its own beast, really. I mean, there, there can be hundreds of millions of people listening around the world, and it, it, you can't you can't even comprehend that normally when you uh, when you think about it. And you're freelance, David, isn't that right? So, like myself, uh, you- yes, I have been uh, have been fully freelance for a little while now. What's it like? It's the question I always get as well. Uh, what's it like being freelance? Is it extra difficult? Is it? I always think it's extra liberating. Uh, what do you think? It, 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 it is extra liberating. I mean, it's it's a roller coaster ride, really. It it, it can be a financial roller coaster. It, it can be an emotional roller coaster. But from my point of view, I I did a a staff job for the BBC for in in Wales for quite a long time, and I enjoyed it immensely. But um, the thing that's great about freelancing is it does give you the freedom to just to just do. And actually, you know, it applies to any industry really. Um, if you're in a a staff job and you want to to do something new, you've got to go and ask your boss or you've got to apply for a new job and and potentially make that jump to to a new job, which may or may not work out. If you're freelance, you can just think, oh, that looks really interesting, this new thing that's popped up at this TV station down the road. I'll just go and knock on the door and see if they need anyone and if there's anything new happening. And it's just the ability to be able to do that. I love the variety of doing a different thing every day. So tonight it's the BBC World Service, it's radio, it's global um, you know, in a couple of days' time, I might be doing TV that's focused on the UK, or I, I also work very closely in business journalism, so I might be doing something that's very focused from that point of view. And David, listening to you, people listening to the podcast will hear that you're chirpy, you're cheery, you're very, <laughs> you, you know, you got an outgoing personality. People who are watching this on YouTube will see the same. So to do what you do on TV and radio, because I did see one of your television reports as well from the Czech Republic, from that vinyl factory, which was fascinating. But you've got to be outgoing and you've got to have that kind of personality that enjoys being on camera and enjoys being in front of the microphone. Isn't that right? Uh, you have, I mean, to a point. It, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'd like to think that it's open to all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds. I'd I'd hate to think that we were moving towards a world where you uh, you ha- had to be very kind of a charismatic, open, smile for the cameras person to do this. Because I think the importance is is in what you're saying and and the stories you're covering and and your ability to do that. Uh, but yeah, I mean you've you've got to uh, if you're working on something like this, you've got to be enthusiastic about it. You've got to kind of you know that the. the that thing I did from the Czech Republic is a good case in point. I mean, I was I was lucky to be able to do that story. It was about vinyl record production. I'm a really big music buff, and I'm I'm you know a big vinyl music collector. Um, and so for something, obviously, I'm going to be enthusiastic about something like this. But you have to approach every story you do and really try and get uh, get excited about it. But that's maybe I, I phrased it wrong. What I was kind of getting at was that on days when you, for example, when you went to Czech Republic to do that report, the days when you feel, ah, I don't want to talk to that many people today, yeah. you still have to stand up in front of a camera and say, hey, I'm here at one of the last vinyl factories in Europe or here in the Czech Republic. And you kind of, you've got to engage the audience and, and bring them into the story. Um, yeah. Uh, and it and it can be difficult sometimes. Uh, you know, not everybody wakes up every morning wanting to be happy and 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 cheerful and do it. I mean, the in some ways the adrenaline of the job does take you through it. Um, that when you you put yourself into that mode and you you put a microphone on and you stand in front of a camera or or in a radio studio or wherever you might be, you know, to a degree when the red light goes on, that that sort of puts you into work mode. That's why I was so surprised uh, when I saw the video you posted on Twitter just the other day. I think it was just two days ago, three days ago? Um, yeah, yeah, a couple of days ago. And you were very honest in the video. You were speaking frankly to the camera and you said, I want to talk about this. It's something I've been dealing with for the last 10 years or so, but I have bipolar disorder. And you, you said as well, you can call it manic depression. And I had seen some of your stuff before and I went back and looked at your Twitter feed and watched some of the videos and I thought, which I know is uh, the misconception and we can get into this in the conversation, but wow, you would never know watching him on TV that he lives with this. When did you first hear the word bipolar disorder? I mean, I, I, I was aware of it as a condition, uh, 
for a while before I before I spoke to somebody about it, um, I, and I'd, I'd read things about it. There was there was quite a high profile documentary in the UK with with Stephen Fry talking about his life with bipolar disorder. I think it was called the Secret Life of the Manic Depressive. Yeah. Uh, so I I saw that, and in a way that that kind of put, opened my eyes to it a little bit, and I and I had a um, a suspicion for a while that I that I might uh, have leanings in that direction, should we say? Uh, but it was about ten years ago that I actually got a diagnosis. But I haven't, as as you said, I haven't been open about it, um, and that um, sort of changed recently because as broadcasters, we're, we're trying to open up the debate over mental health. We're, we're we like to think that we're moving into a new era where people can be more open about it. We're trying to break down some of the stigmas around all sorts of of mental health uh, issues, and. I've been involved in a few conversations lately within production teams where we've talked about this sort of thing and we've talked about the the need to be open and, and talk about it. And in the back of my head, there was a little part of me saying, well, it's a bit hypocritical of me, really, because I'm I'm nodding along and I'm agreeing and said, yes, it's very important that we talk about it and we're open. But actually, I'm, I'm keeping this quiet. And the reason you don't talk about it is you're afraid about how people will react, misconceptions around bipolar disorder, People will think you're unreliable in the workplace, especially as a freelancer. I'm sure like there's so many reasons. The, the other thing as well, and this is, um, and, I, and I hope this changes going forward, but it's like a lot of things in life. There's never a good time to have that conversation because when you first get a diagnosis, your first, uh, your f- initially you're looking to just kind of come to terms with it yourself and you're, you're in a position where you're trying to work out what this means and you might be getting treatment or you might be you know seeing somebody about it so i think initially your focus is in just kind of working it out for yourself and that's not really the time at which you want to sit down and tell people and then as it goes on there's never really a kind of clear defined moment that says this is where you should sit down and tell people and all of those other issues come into it as well um i was still a staff employee when i when i was diagnosed i didn't tell anybody in my old workplace about it either and there's a degree of, you know, if there's a promotion opportunity or the opportunity opportunity to work on a project, are they going to give it to somebody else because they're worried I'm going to, you know, suddenly disappear for a week because I'm not feeling very well? Mm. Um, and yeah, there, there is a there is a real risk that you know, people will treat you differently. Um, and and as you say, I mean, as a freelancer, that that's amplified times ten. You know, I my own ignorance, I don't know anything about bipolar, but. You grow up with this idea that someone who who is bipolar can just be seemingly fine one minute and then snap and do something crazy and dangerous. You know, I always grew up thinking, ooh, people who have bipolar are dangerous. Like, you know, you can understand someone who is depressed, uh, someone who has OCD, you can kind of understand what that might be like uh, to a certain extent. But bipolar, you just have this idea maybe from Hollywood that a normal person can do something crazy and outlandish and dangerous and they can't I th- control I mean, I it. Think that's, I think that's a big part of it, isn't it? Um, we've seen, you know, the, the historically, the portrayals of, of mental health from Hollywood and, and other media outlets have always been great. You know, they're usually the crime dramas with the serial killer or something mm. like that, or the, the Jekyll and Hyde type thing. I mean, that that is that is basically, you know, looking at a bipolar type situation. Um, but the, actually, like a lot of conditions, mental health, physical health, there's a wide range of people with a wide range of symptoms, and and there are so many people who experience things in different ways. Um, and for some people, it really does, you know, far more than it does with me. For some people, it really does impact their daily lives. Some people can have much milder symptoms, but it can still be, you know, a thing they have to live with. Um, but you know, in terms of whether people are dangerous, I think very few people are are, are actually dangerous, and and most people. You know, just welcome a bit of support, I think, and a bit of a, a bit of understanding from people. You're right. It's the it's those series and those movies and the Hollywood portrayal where I didn't want to say it, but you said it, where the serial killer or the the baddie or the evil one is always like portrayed uh-huh. as having some, you know, the mental asylum person or the bipolar or whatever. I was surprised, and, and this was me learning as well, when you said bipolar or call it manic depressive, they're the same thing, or it's. Uh, I mean, manic depression. I, as as I understand it, I'm not I'm not a, a a complete expert, but as I understand, I mean, manic depression is 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 seen as a slightly outdated term by some, um, and historically, you know, that's how people will be referred to. I 
Personally, I don't feel it's a terrible term because it's a lot more descriptive um, of the condition than bipolar disorder is. And sometimes a more clinical description can actually scare people a little bit more. And how does it affect you, David, day to day? I'm sure it's a difficult question to answer because no two days are the same for anybody, but especially someone living with bipolar. So how does it affect your life? Um, it's, I mean, the, 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 I mean, that's exactly it. No, no two days are the same, but I, I tend to go through periods so that there will be, you know, there will be periods of depression and periods where I, you know, as you, you mentioned before, the days when you just don't want to get out of bed and you don't want to do anything. Um, and days where you just, you just can't get your head around the idea of, of committing to anything or even just even just starting something, the idea of even just kind of getting dressed is, it seems like the most, you know, unobtainable dream that you, you just sort of can't even get things moving. Um, and I'm very lucky that I've had friends around me in the past who have, have almost literally dragged me out of bed before now mm. <laughs> to go get me to, to kind of engage and, and, and to go and kind of get something underway. Uh, and then the flip side of that is that there can be periods where, you get tremendously, um, you know, excited about something and involved in something. Uh, and actually, I, th I think a lot of people think that the, the depressive episodes can be the most difficult, and they, and they are difficult. But actually, I think a lot of people will say that sometimes the manic episodes can have more of an impact on your life. Um, they can be, you know, episodes of manic behavior can can really make people a little cautious about being around you sometimes. Uh, but also... Um, they can affect you financially. I've had times where I've had this, what I'm convinced is this great, the greatest idea ever that I'm going to start this new business project or I'm going to um, start a new thing. And, and in the course of an evening, sometimes I've gone out and bought lots of equipment or, oh. or signed up for things or, you know, I've heard all manner of stories about people who've, who've been in manic episodes, who've, you know, blown away thousands of pounds on, on things because they think it's an amazing idea at the time and nothing can, can persuade them um, that maybe they should be a little bit cautious. And then, of course, the cruel part of it is, you know, a period of time later, um, you could be in a more depressive state um, and then you're having to sort of deal with the fallout from from that manic episode uh, wow. at a time when you're, you're really not terribly well equipped to do it. Mm. And David, when you describe laying in bed, people watching and listening now will know what it's like to wake up in the morning and not want to go to work or face the day. But this is at a whole deeper level where you, you said that you can't even imagine getting dressed. But what's going through your head? What's the alternative? Are you thinking, I'm just going to lay here, go back to sleep, or just lay here looking at the wall or my phone? Or what What does your brain desire to do? I don't, I don't think there's even that level of planning goes into it. I mean, I, as I say, I, I say this with the caveat that everybody has a slightly different experience with these things. But I, I, I don't think you even think um, beyond being in bed, I, th I think there's a there's a knowledge in your head that you should be getting out of bed and you should be doing something, um, and but there the just isn't the ability to motivate yourself. I think that's a that's a good way of putting it to motivate yourself. What, what I mean, the way I experience it is a real lack of motivation. Um, and you mentioned um, the workplace before, and that's a good thing because I, I know a lot of people have struggled uh, with work when they, they have bipolar disorder or other conditions. I've been fortunate and that's that's been the one thing that has sort of kept me going. Even at my absolute worst, I have, for the most part, still managed to force myself out of bed. And I think in a way, having this sort of occupation when you're involved in broadcast media, um, you absolutely have to be in a particular place at a particular time because that's mm. the nature of what you do. And that's almost been... I've got such a broadcast mentality in my head that I always think, well, I absolutely can't not be in the studio at that time when I yes. need to be. So yeah. that has almost been the the thing that has saved me, I think, because it, it has forced me to get out of bed and go where I need to do. During the manic spells, David, is it a case that you are not sleeping at night because your mind is racing with these ideas? You're feeling great about everything. Is that one of the... Um, that, that can happen. I mean... Uh, Another factor of the broadcast industry is your sleep patterns tend to be a bit erratic anyway. Um, and, and often, it, yeah, it, it can be difficult. I know some people suffer a lot more with sleep than, than I do. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I'm, there's been times when I've just sort of got an idea in my head and got in the car and driven to the other side of the country or right? <laughs> so really? things like that. So uh, yeah, it has been known to happen. Um, that you, you drove to the other side of the country because you had a, like an idea of something or... I'm, I'm trying to remember that exact, exactly what that was now. But yeah, I, that there are times when I just sort of thought, oh, I'm, it'd be really great to do this or I need to go and see this person or, you know... Um, and it sort of removes a bit of the filter in a way that that, that stops you from doing that. Um, but in terms of being able to sleep at night, I, I've I've not been too bad in that respect. But yeah, there have been times where um, it's more that you you just sort of get. Um, I find I get so involved in an idea or something I want to do that I'll be I'll be sat at the computer, sort of squirreling away on it. And you suddenly realise it's three in the morning, and you have to be at work at, at nine or, or something like that. And it's and it just sort of it takes that rational thought and planning away. I was watching some videos prior to this interview with people who have bipolar, and there was one video, a great video, and they were saying, "Here's some advice for how to live and cope with bipolar." And the first rule was sobriety. They said, "If you have manic depression, stay away from alcohol." Uh, all drugs, of course, but gambling as well, especially gambling. Um, what do you think of those? Uh, I mean, gambling is is. I mean, it's it's one of those things. I I I avoid gambling for the most part because I I'm I'm just naturally I'm not one of these people that's very good at, at self control. You know, I I open a packet of biscuits and I I, I find it difficult to eat just one. I've got to go and eat a whole lot. <laughs> and I think that's you know that's that's a fairly trivial uh, way of of doing it. But I think I think a lot of people will relate to that and. I have gone through periods actually where I've, I've been, um, uh, and this this was kind of connected to some manic episodes where I've got a little bit obsessed with things like lottery scratch cards and things, and I've I kind of convinced myself that if I if I play certain strategies, that I'm guaranteed to win. Or I'd, I've had other kind of experience. I, I wouldn't describe myself as a as a gambling addict um, specifically uh, because I think this is linked to bipolar disorder. It's not a, a sort of general addiction. Um, but I try and limit myself because I know I have that sort of addictive personality that it's it's difficult to stop. Um, sobriety, yeah, I, I suppose that would probably make things better. I I've got to confess, I you know I've, I'm I'm not what you call a teetotal person. Um, but yeah, I mean those those kind of things probably probably don't help. Yeah, you can imagine with the with the terrible lows and the drink would just kind of push it further. With the manic highs, the party's on. The drink kind of keeps Brilliant. you going that bit longer, or and and there is a whole there is a whole uh, issue of of what's called self medication here, where mm. people uh, use things and, and alcohol is is a common one, uh, you know, drugs and and all sorts of other activities as a way of of trying to trying to manage it in that way. And in terms of you, David, dealing with it, and by the way, I just want uh, people to know that I am hope I'm not asking you anything that's too intrusive. I'm trying to just think of things to ask you from the video that you released publicly, but you mentioned in it as well about um, self, not self-medicating, but the, you, you had tried many different types of medication with varying results. And at the moment, I think you said you were not taking any medication for it. Um, so I know that from my own limited knowledge, lithium has been uh, successful for certain people. When you were trying different medication, what was that experience like? Uh, I haven't I haven't taken lithium. But I know I know people that have. Um, I it, it is a really difficult thing. I, I mean, I can I can tell you about my my personal experience in that when I I was initially prescribed. Um, uh, uh, one, I, I, I won't, I won't get into the names of individual drugs and things, but I was initially prescribed one uh, form of medication, and, it, and it's one of these things that you you have to um, be very careful. You you can't just sort of take a full dose. You've got to start very small and and gradually build yourself up to 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 a dose. And it and it's really difficult um, to judge how well something like this is working. When I started taking it, I was in a particularly depressed state. And then within a week or so, I was actually feeling a lot better. Now, the, the problem with a condition like bipolar disorder is you're never actually sure if it's the medication that's done that or if it is your just natural uh, cycle in a way. Um, so after getting up to what was still quite a low dose, I, I went back um, to the hospital and said, oh, this is brilliant. This is working really well. 
Um, and actually, I, I, don't, I don't think it was the medication at all. It was just the, the way that I changed in that time. And, and at a period after that, I, you know, had a bit of a um, another depressive episode. That you know, uh, and it's it's quite difficult to gauge how these things are are working. Um, so we we sort of progressed with that a little bit, uh, but I didn't really see any great um, results from that. I mean, that that is. That is an issue of bipolar disorder in general, is that you're not the best person to judge your own situation because the way you're looking at it by its nature is skewed by the mood that you're in at the time. And I first got to a stage where I got diagnosed because I was uh, living with someone for a period of time who who was able to judge me and be almost a kind of, in, not impartial observer, but to somebody who was able to look from the outside and was able to analyze it a bit more. But from my point of view, a really big part of it has been self-awareness and just getting, you know, prior to being diagnosed, I'd be in this situation and you're never really quite sure why you're feeling that way. Um, and you're never really aware of the the kind of ups and downs of of, of how it works and, and how that um, is affecting you. And just having that diagnosis from a from a professional and then being able to look into it and find out more about the condition. And I just got more aware of myself. Is it something that you're born with, David, or is it something that you develop in life? Or for you, when did it start? I mean, I can't. I can't. Obviously, I can't really comment on on what was life was like way back into infancy. But I mean, I I clearly throughout childhood had um, had something, and there's a big debate on on how early you can get um, diagnosed with a condition like this. And I know some people. Uh, around the world have been diagnosed at very, very young ages. And there's a lot of a debate over whether you can really, really do that at that age. I mean, certainly I would say in my teenage years, mm. um, I'm sure I went through a lot of difficulties because I was perhaps looking at the world in a in a less than balanced way. Uh, and looking back now, I think, well, that was, that was clearly related to this. Um, at the time, you know, I, I was a teenager in the 1990s, um, Mental health issues like this certainly weren't talked about in the same way that they are now. And, uh, you know, I think there was a bit of a, a hesitation to think of yourself in that way. Is it something that you have to live with forever? Is there a cure? Is there a, a time when it could wear off? Um, I mean, nobody nobody has mentioned a cure to me. Um, I mean, the, there is there is research going on into things like this all the time. And there's there's some very productive looks at, at how you know how the brain works, at how uh, brains, you know, people's brains differ depending on 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 mental conditions they have. Um, I've sort of taken my eye off the ball a little bit with regards to medication because I've sort of decided for the time being that I'm going to stay away from that and try and look at other ways. And there are lots of other ways. There are you know there are more sort of talking therapies and there are, there are no non medication ways of. Uh, of dealing with this. Um, there are even, you know, people who have been prescribed exercise regimes and, you know, more physical ways of battling against it. And I, and I know that's effective. I, you know, just getting out of bed and, and going for a long walk, could, you know, when I was at periods at my worst, um, that can, that can help tremendously. Um, in terms of a, of a cure, I mean, it's, it's difficult. A, a lot of people are saying, well, should we be viewing this as a disease that needs to be cured? You know, in a, in a neurodiverse society, you know, people mm. are saying that autism, ADHD, shouldn't be seen as a disease that people need to be freed from. They should be seen as just a different way of being in the same way that we don't view gender, race, religion as a disease. They're just the different ways of approaching life. Mm. Maybe that's a bad comparison, but... Um, and I, I must uh, check with you as well, because I know at the start I was saying bipolar disorder. That is the correct name, or is a bipolar condition? I mean, bi bipolar disorder was, was the name I was presented with when I was diagnosed. Um, you know, maybe we should look at it as a condition rather than disorder. Um, it's difficult because there are, there are very, there are very uh, wide-ranging, there are very wide-ranging points of view on this. Mm. Um, you know, and I, and I don't want, I don't want to make it seem you know, there are certainly people who are dealing with the the rough end of this who would absolutely see it as a disorder and see it yeah. that and there's something they want to be freed from. But at the same time, there are and... people that 
that yeah that but the, the, at the same time there are there are people that that kind of just just see it as a, as a as a different way of being in that way yeah and I mean, there, there are i i i had after posting the video i had a lot of responses um from people on online and i had one in particular from a guy who who i'd had followed on twitter but had never discussed this before and and, and he hadn't been necessarily open about it but has said you know i i i have the same condition i am in this position but you know, it gives me creativity. It enables me to see the world in a different way, um, and there are positives from it. And actually, in in a creative industry like this, I, I do. I, you know, I wonder in some ways if I'd even be doing this if it, if it wasn't for bipolar disorder. David, you read in my mind because that was the next <laughs> thing I was going to say to you that in the line of work that you do and that I do too, where. Um, last weekend I was in Vienna for your station, the BBC World Service, making a documentary with a lady who is an interrogator at Guantanamo Bay and is now a, a scholar in, in Abbey in Austria. But um, having been able to connect with people's lives that are in no way the same as yours is a, is a talent and a, a gift to be able to do that and to kind of get into their head and way of thinking. And maybe it means you have extra empathy then if you're doing a documentary on someone who has a me mental illness or condition or disorder or someone who just is different than uh, what is quote unquote normal, if you know what I mean. So maybe, yeah, it does help you in a way in the work that you do in your broadcasting. Um, it there's certainly a lot of creative people who appear to have it, whether whether that is musicians, artists. Now, I I don't want to say that it's you know <laughs> propagate the image that oh well it's it's only kind of you know yeah. eccentric creatives um, because there are people from all walks of life in this situation. But there does seem to be a link with with more creative. I mean, I, I mentioned that that documentary with Stephen Fry as as an actor and and, and comedian, um, and there does seem to be a a connection with that before I, I finish by asking you about your greatest passion in life which i think is music is that fair to say <laughs> one of them yes you're married now where you have a partner you're I, i'm with a partner yes and uh, how, how many years have you been together oh um eight years now eight years i'm glad you remember that because you'd be in trouble buddy if you didn't <laughs> um how is it for her is it difficult um yeah yeah i mean it must be i mean she she does um we were talking about this. Obviously, we've talked about it a lot since I since I I made the uh, since I put the video live, and we we talked about it quite a bit since. And and I think she's in the same way that I have dealt with it, uh, becoming more aware of it. I think I think she has done the same thing, and and she, um, particularly with the more manic phases, you know, when I'll suddenly come up with an idea and think, do you know what? Wouldn't it be great to do this? We should do this, and and I'll start formulating something. And I think she's learned now, rather than try and shoot it down in flames and go, no, that's a lot of fish, that's a yeah. terrible idea. The best thing to do is just to kind of play along a little bit. And then, you know, in a day or so on, I've completely forgotten about that. David, what advice would you give people? I know I have uh, friends who suffer from depression. One person I know in particular, very severe depression. And it can be very difficult when you're sitting with them because it's you want to almost scream at them. And I know this sounds terrible, but you just want to kind of shake them and help them and see the world the way you do or have the outlook in life that you do. Um, and then you meet them again and again and nothing seems to change and you can feel like giving up. When someone I, think is, I think one of the biggest, I mean, I, this is another factor that I've, I've learned over time. And I think if you could think rationally about this, and this is why being aware of it has, has helped so much, but I think if you could be more objective about it, you would be in a depressive period and you'd think to yourself, right, okay, you feel really low at the moment, but don't worry. This is just the condition. In a few days time, you'll be fine. The problem is it, it for me at least, it really doesn't work like that. Mm. And and you get, you get sort of completely enveloped in it. And it's really difficult to see out of that hole and to see the fact that you know, in a couple of days, couple of weeks time, things will be different. You're completely absorbed in the situation you're in. Now, being more aware of it has improved that somewhat. And having good people around you who understand it has improved it as well. And so, you know, in terms of advice I could offer, you know, I absolutely understand that situation where you're with someone and you say like, come on, this is, this is, you know, it's going to get better. 
but I also understand absolutely that that they're in a position where they they really can't see that. Mm. Um, but in terms of advice I've offered, I I just think what has helped me more than anything has just been awareness. The first stage being getting diagnosed, but then learning to be a bit more self analytical, learning how it affects me, how I deal with it, and just trying to formulate coping strategies from doing that. And advice for the friends or for someone like me is maybe there, there is nothing you can do at that moment, but just remind them you're there, but really there's nothing. I mean, I've, I've had some great friends. I remember distinctively one point in, in my past where we'd sort of half arranged with some friends to go out and go and, you know, go and see something, go and walk up a mountain. And that morning I was, you know, I was stuck in bed and I just thought, I really can't be bothered with this. I don't want to go off, you know, up some thing. I'm, you know, I, I don't want to move from here at the moment. And actually, you know, they pretty much came to my house and hammered off a tour. And of course, when someone's literally outside your front door, it's quite difficult to ignore them. That's um, true. <laughs> and, and, and and I did get out of bed and I did go off. And, and, and actually, people like that are fantastic. And, you know, if, if you're fortunate enough to have people like that around you, it's great. And it's difficult because sometimes wading in and, you know, physically drawing someone out of bed isn't the right thing to do. Um, but, you know, to encourage somebody to get out of that hole and, and to go off and, and do something and whether it's, you know, whether it's just some, some stimulation of something else, it's always helped me tremendously. Well, David, I should be interviewing those friends of yours because when, when you're thinking <laughs> you, you can't even think or conceive of getting dressed, but they got you to climb a mountain that day. So, I mean, that's uh, pretty good pressure, going. Pressure can come in many forms. <laughs> now, I, because you love music and you're a big vinyl collector, I was watching another interview with someone who had bipolar and they actually recommended that music is a good outlet for people who have bipolar. What was the quote they said? I wrote it down. They said, music that will help you when you're going too fast and then listen to music that will help you when you're going too slow in your moods. Do you find that music helps you with your condition? Tremendously, yes. Um, I've got and actually, actually, is it, I've not really thought about it before. Maybe this is part of it. I've got a very eclectic taste in music. In the in in the the records I own at home, there's there's a there's a, a great range of something, and I change a lot as well. It's one of the questions I hate getting asked is when people say, well, "What's your what's your favorite? You know, the favorite record you own or something." Uh, that and was I've my always... next question here. What's your favorite <laughs> record? <laughs> Please don't. Um, at, but the reason I find it difficult, and actually, maybe this is this is quite linked to the condition because it. It changes an awful lot. That takes it back a little bit to what you're saying about about freelancing and being um, having that variation in life. I think I think there's a bit of that there as well. But I thought that was uh, so fascinating, and I would have never have thought of that. Uh, the big dum dum that I am, but that if someone who is uh, and this worked for them, as you say, it might work for other people. But when they are feeling that in that manic state, that they can listen to a bit of Simon and Garfunkel or something that will bring it the mood down a bit. And when they're feeling really, really low, they can listen to something, the Pearl Jam, I don't know, something that will bring it up a bit. And that's how they help to moderate their condition and their frame of mind. Yeah, that's and it's, it's, not, it's not always even, even that off, obvious that you want to sort of listen to happy music at happy times. I mean, I, I gain a lot of pleasure from some quite down-tempo music. I, you know... I've always been a big fan of of the blues, but it it doesn't make me feel blue. Actually, blues music makes me very happy indeed. Um, and I can, you know, I, I I've been on a bit of a JJ Kale kind of obsessive of late, and listening to some of his stuff, and and you know, I find that that really uplifting. I, you know, I know I know the backstory to the blues and why it's called the blues, but I find it very uplifting. Whereas sometimes I can listen to something that's supposed to sound very happy, and I go off. Oh, I don't want to listen to this again. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's you mean, whatever works for you. Hang on a second. You mean shiny, happy people doesn't make you feel like a shiny, happy person? That is that is not necessarily one of my favorite records. <laughs> Didn't Michael Stipe from, uh, is, is that the guy's name, isn't it? From REM, Michael yeah, Stipe. Yeah, yeah. Didn't he say that like he never wants to hear that song or sing it again? He detests <laughs> it or... I love that song. It's, uh, but the um, what you said there as well, uh, it just sounded like a radio ad for a blues show on the BBC. You said, uh, the blues don't make me feel blue. They actually make me feel pretty happy. Join me, David Harper, tonight at nine on BBC <laughs> World Service. I shall suggest that one to the boss at some point. Yes, I get 10% of everything. Well, finally, um, we'll end this on a song. We can play it on the audio version, but we can't play it on the YouTube version. So for those of you who watch this, 
I'm sorry, but go over and listen to it on Spotify or wherever, but a, a song you want to finish on. It can be a song that has helped you. It can be a song that you just listened to. It can be anything at all. What would you like to play? Maybe the best kept secret, the closing uh, song off that album, um, that, that fits into a lot of situations. The best kept secret. David Harper, it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you for being so honest and open with your story. No doubt it will help other people and just, uh, I've learned a lot from it. It's raised my awareness and I'm sure everyone else who listened too. And hey, we'll keep an ear out for you tonight and as time goes on on the BBC World Service. Thank you very much.